Good evening. I'm Dr. Sarah Lewis, Associate Professor and Chair of Contemplative Psychotherapy and Buddhist Psychology. And I'm so delighted that this year CPBP had the honor of hosting the 2021 Lens Distinguished Lecturer. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Yasmin Sedula. And she is a black feminist political theorist of abolition and co-author of Radical Dharma, Talking Race, Love and Liberation, co-authored with Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams and Lama Rod Owens, published by North Atlantic Books in 2016. Dr. Sedula is Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Vassar College, and she holds a PhD in politics with a designated emphasis in feminist studies and history of consciousness from UC Santa Cruz, and a BA from Brown University in religious studies with a focus in Western nihilism and Buddhist philosophy. And we're so happy um, to host Dr. Sedula, particularly during Black History Month, uh, as her work really has prompted uh, a reckoning with racial, racial justice and white supremacy at large, as well as in Buddhist communities in particular. So knowing that uh, so many of us here at Naropa have uh, read Radical Dharma with great interest, um, I know many of us are quite delighted to be able to spend time uh, this week with her. I'd also like to thank the Lens Foundation for supporting this lecture and bringing uh, Dr. Sedula to uh, come speak with us virtually. Um, and so now it's my great pleasure and honor um, to introduce uh, Dr. Sedula, who will be speaking on surviving white supremacy towards a radical dharma of staying fugitive. Greetings. It's wonderful to meet you all. My name is Yasmin Sadula. I am a, an assistant professor at Vassar College and one of the co-authors for Radical Dharma. Um, I just want to start by thanking you all for having me to here. It's such an honor. Um, I'm, as I was just sharing earlier, one of the least well-known members of the Radical Dharma co-authoring team and um, it's just a really huge privilege to be here. I dreamt of coming to Naropa um, when I thought I was going to be pursuing Buddhist studies when I was uh, just recently graduated from undergrad and this is just an incredible way to be a part of your community. So I look forward to all of the conversations that we're going to have um, in uh, conjunction with this talk and um, I want to apologize ahead of time for reading it, uh, but this is my habit as a scholar and I also just want to stay, uh, you know, mindful of time. And so I hope you'll forgive me that. Um, also just really want to thank Jason Davis and Sarah Lewis for all of the effort that they extended um, to, to make this a super smooth and generous uh, process, especially given the delays of COVID and the changes um, therein. Your work behind the scenes has really made this an incredible, incredible experience. So my talk today is called Surviving White Supremacy Towards a Radical Dharma of Staying Fugitive. And it really builds off the last essay in Radical Dharma, um, which I might share a little bit of at the end. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of bring some improvisational spontaneity, as I said, but uh, we'll, we'll begin by reading. So I have a 20 year, uh, in addition to being an academic, I have a 20 year contemplative practice. And my, really, my journey towards my seat on my cushion really started as a rebellious preacher's daughter um, in New York City in search of spirituality without deities is probably how I would have put it when I was 16. And then when I was 16, 17, and 21, um, my father, who's part of the Episcopal Church, took me along with him on, on three pilgrimages um, to this small monastic community in France called Taizé. And if you know uh, Taizé, you know that it's a incredibly rich um, space of uh, chanting and meditation uh, based in Christianity, but inclusive of all different folks. Um, there are people there, I think the first time I was there was the most populous, it was summertime. And I was so young, I was 16, and there were 
7,000, 8,000 young people there. And when they say young people, they mean people under the age of 35. So sadly, I'm no longer one, but it seemed like I was one forever. And this space um, was uh, the first place where I really tapped into the healing power of silence. And the healing power of silence was not something I found alone, but was something I found in congregation with others, that kind of collective silence that really uh, does more than clear one's mind. It taps one into a sense of forgiveness, a space of not just possibility, but of healing, of repair. Um, the idea that there were things that I'd done that were irreparable melted away in that space, even though I had a very uneasy relationship with Christianity. So in college, I started out as a philosophy student with big questions about morality and why we as a national community in Western culture have such a gaping cavern between our most cherished ideals and our traditions and practices. From domestic violence and rape to genocide and slavery, it was clear to me that on some level of thought, there was an inconsistency, crossed wires in the virtues we ascribe to freedom and equality to all and to all, right? It doesn't obviously extend that far and the practical everyday ways we practice serving and protecting those virtues. My questions were too empirical for the course of an analytic philosophy that I found myself in and made my way across the street to religious studies. Um, in Buddhist studies in particular, I studied some history, but was mostly taken by the Dharma itself, the philosophy, how directly did Buddhist philosophies, particularly of the Mahayana tradition, directly address the implicit paradox of the Western colonial project. This paradox being that on one hand, we have a freedom rooted in personal sovereignty, personal autonomy of will, and thus personal responsibility. And on the other, this is, and I'll add, this is a freedom in theory for most and um, practice for in practice for a precious gender class and race pillaging not privileging few right and on the other we have a freedom rooted in interdependence decentered egoism and impermanence a freedom in practice everywhere and in theory for most of the eastern hemisphere i was fascinated one might say even hardcore addicted to the pursuit of freedom of the mind as an academic, a budding up academic, and as a you know tokenized uh, black person who is um, typically the only black, the only person of color and woman in my philosophy courses, um, there is something a proximity to power there that I found incredibly intoxicating, and. Um, so I was experiencing that at the same time as I volunteered in a local women's prison, facilitating creative writing workshops for the women who lived inside and was really brought to tears by the paradox uh, that <sighs> brought to tears um, of heartbreak and rage, uh, sharing stories of home with them because these stories were full of longing and loss and intimacy and care and love, so much love, hearing what it meant for them to feel at home and how vulnerable their harms were, their homes were as children and parents, as mothers and partners to police intervention and state, state, state sanctioned uh, separation was life changing. Um, as I left the prison for a long drive back to my Ivy League campus, I thought about the freedom uh, I experienced as the ability to leave. Freedom as the unimpeded, unimpeded range of mobility I was granted through my class privilege, through my access to education, my ability to travel from carceral space to collegiate space, as I would, um, from carceral space, as, as I now call it, right, spaces of incarceration, punitive spaces, to collegiate space, um, 
to protected space with minimal disruption to my privacy or convenience, these were the insights that left an incredible impression in addition to the violence and aggression of the correction officers and the extent to which, um, you know, there were so many people uh, inside who had varying degrees of access to communities outside. There are a couple women that we saw there who um, spoke no English and were being detained and I just, and they were teenagers and I just, um, Think of them still as particularly in this moment as so many of our beings on this on this uh, in this country risk deportation just by living their lives so while my experiences in prison were anecdotal at best recent statistics show that the stories i heard while i was inside were not the exception but the rule I want to share with you some here for the fact sheet from a fact sheet developed in defense of Marissa Alexander, um, who, whose case you may be familiar with. Um, but if you're not, Marissa, Marissa Alexander um, on August 1st, 2010, defended herself against her husband by firing a warning shot to deter his advance on her in, her, in their home nine days after giving birth to her premature daughter. Marissa Alexander was attacked by her abusive, estranged husband in their shared home, and she writes, quote, In an unprovoked, jealous rage, my husband violently confronted me while using the restroom. He assaulted me, shoving, strangling, and holding me against my will, preventing me from fleeing all while I, while I begged for him to leave. Against my will. He attacked her while his sons were in the home. Marissa retrieved her lawfully registered gun and fired a warning shot towards uh, the wall, upward into the wall to prevent him from beating her to death, which um, he had a pattern of attempting. No one was injured by her warning shot. And yet the state that supported a stand your ground defense for George Zimmerman uh, was denied to Marissa Alexander. Uh, and that kind of Im Im immunity from prosecution, uh, the response was not immunity, of course, it was, but she was charged with three counts of assault with a deadly weapon and received a mandatory minimum sentence of 20 years in prison. Her appeals went on for many years and the stand your ground laws were, uh, as a consequence, amended to include the right to fire warning shots. However, no judge saw fit to have to allow Marissa to benefit from the legal augmentation that her her case explicitly inspired. So in November 24th, 2014, Marissa Alexander accepted a plea deal with the state of Cal with the state of uh, Florida. And uh, this plea deal included time served and an additional 65 days and two years of probation serving house detention while wearing surveillance monitors, right? She was finally released from jail January 27th, 2015. So I think about this case a lot when I'm thinking about what it means in that classic Tracy Chapman line, um, why is a woman still not safe when she's in her home? I can't sing, but you know the song and you know this line resonates in ways that um, we are still in the process of understanding. We are still in the process of trying to hold space for. We are still in the process of imagining what justice looks like when there's nowhere to go where you are safe. A national and international movement mobilized in defense of Marissa, Marissa Alexander's freedom, her defenders made critical connections between our national history of anti-Black violence, the culpability of the criminal justice system and the perpetuation of sexual predation, perpetrating violence against women, wives, daughters, sons, children, elders with impunity when so many, when so many of us, as Miriam Kaba pronounced in an art exhibit erected to raise funds for Marissa's defense, 
says, um, so many of us have no selves to defend. The question of freedom then many of us in the West face have fought, has far less to do with personal sovereignty and autonomy of will and far more to, more to do with interdependence, collective acts of resistance, in this congregationally reinforced faith that the world as it is can change, that it isn't permanent itself. Um, but some more of just a few statistics as the Marissa, Free Marissa Now Archive uh, reported in 2017, 70% of people in women's prison are mothers. The number of mothers in prison in the U.S. increased by 122% between 1991 and 2007 when I was visiting women's prisons. Not only are the vast majority of women, people in women's prisons mothers when they enter prison, but many of these people are also the primary caretakers of their children at home. And this came up often um, in the poetry that I would hear from the women, the testaments that I would hear from the women inside. Many were terrified that they would come out, they would get out and then not be able to get their children back. 1.3 million children are affected by female imprisonment, right? So these spaces don't just punish the people that they lock up. They also punish the families that those who are locked up have to leave behind. This number includes the children at home when the mother is imprisoned and the babies born and raised in prison. In 33 states in the U.S., it is legal to shackle a female inmate while she is giving birth. 31 of these states do not require prison employees to check with medical staff before determining whether or not a prisoner should be restrained. And there's an incredible account of what it's like to give birth in shackles in prison um, by Asada Shakur and just one of the most incredible prison histories and carceral narratives that we have at our, in our canon um, to learn from and to grow with. The movement is still being inspired by today. As those of you who have heard the Black Lives Matter rallying cry would know. So what does our freedom have to do with this, these statistics, right? Those of us who don't see ourselves in danger of being incarcerated just by, you know, driving a car or walking into a store or going wine tasting. We, and I'm generally speaking, uh, including myself here, who have freedom of mobility, who have freedom to leave violent and hostile circumstances with little inconvenience or disruption to our own sense of privacy, how is our ability to feel at home in our bodies, families, homes, neighborhoods, and communities impacted by the realities of so many for whom home is a penetrable space, penetrable by, penetrable by the state, and by state violence. For so many who do not have homes to re retreat to for safety, for stru from structural inequity or racial and gendered violence, what is our connection to them? Can we even feel the parts of ourselves that are constantly under surveillance, vulnerable to policing, criminalization, detention, and incarceration? And when I say ourselves, I mean now our greater community because we are there is so much i was just speaking earlier today with um some folks who work on prison journalism and what they're doing is teaching folks inside to become journalists of their own circumstances so they're not just being reported on but they can also do the reporting themselves. And it's so important that this work happen right now because the visibility is so high, right? Um, the attention of the world is on us. The discrepancies in our administration of justice are in broad relief for all to see. And it's only a matter of time before the rhetoric of the movement becomes the policy of the nation. And it's gonna be very, very important that as that transition, as that translation, as that transmutation takes place, that the rhetoric and the ideas not lose the vibrancy, the fervor, the um, political edge of their inaugural activist origins. 
I think about this a lot because of the inauguration and how present the language of um, abolition, the language of Black Lives Matter was in that space, in our president's mouth, nonetheless. So our societal reliance on prisons and policing to keep us safe has become a national dharma, a national law, a carceral dharma that saturates the lives of those whom the law deems beyond redemption and leaves with no selves to defend. But our inter interdependence on it for our perception of personal safety also contaminates our thoughts, right? Um, we are interdependent on these carceral logics. We need them in order for traffic to flow. We need them in order to keep our houses and homes safe, to keep our children um, safe if they get lost or stolen, right? To have a recourse. They're, these are real challenges to public safety that we face, right? Not all problems that we face can be so easily solved um, without calling the police. And yet there are alternatives, right? So the challenge of this moment is that we have been relying for generations on a one-stop shop solution to a complex set of social problems. And in order to find an alternative, we will need a complex set of alternatives, right? There's not gonna be a silver bullet. And the problem is, right, um, even beyond this, that the ways that we've become reliant on prisons and policing has really saturated our own consciousness, really the seat of our own understanding and sense of safety, what it means to feel at home, relies on this logic, relies on this punitive surveillance, caging and throwing people away. It's just, it's, it's a, a, a challenge to sit with. It really, it, even in this present moment, The challenge then is to see how that carceral logic so saturates our sense of safety, our personal sense of home, that we turn it against ourselves. We turn it against each other. We call the police on aspects of ourselves that we think might not be valuable, right? Um, there are all different kinds of ways that I'm sure you know you do this and that you do it to others, right? In my own personal experience, um, coming into consciousness as a Black queer woman was not easy. <laughs> the entire world says everything about that alignment is incorrect. Try again. Try wider. Try manlier. Try to be straighter, right? And so in order to not throw those parts of myself away, um, I had to really fight for them. That was not uh, something that was just gifted to me or taken for granted. Um, and learning to not punish myself for being someone who is different, for some, being someone who might challenge my parents, who, who might challenge the circumstances that I enter, um, has taken some real work. And I think that the work that we have to do, you know, on an individual level, we can't do alone. We need communities in order to hold us while we grapple with the fact that we've been our own correction officers, that we've been um, judge and jury to each other, right? For not being enough, for not being down enough, woke enough, black enough, right? Um, certainly in this contemporary moment, as the right is saying, you're not American enough. Um, there are all kinds of ways that we are seeing this proliferation of what I call carceral logics. And this is not just what I call, but this is what uh, people in critical carceral studies are really thinking of expansively um, as a force of carceral power that moves beyond brick and mortar prisons 
and into the ether, into our culture, into our um, everyday behaviors, right? So under pressure of threat that we have only one practice to call the police, this single act is the universal solution to what, like I said, a complex matrix of interrelated mal effects of settler colonialism and um, capitalism, slavery, uh, all of these effects that create systems of harm, cultures of violence, the as yet unfolding legacy of slavery, capitalism, lynching culture, rape culture, and the disposability with which we... <sighs> Um, really compost the life-giving labor of love that is reproductive care work in our culture. It, we just consistently from domestic workers to mothering to um, care economies, we devalue care um, in ways that are very much hurting our, our uh, culture. For many of us, this past year has been a wake-up call, a visceral, gut-wrenching, break, heartbreaking call to wake up and feel the effects of systemic racism and the carceral dharma of our national practice of freedom. And we're feeling it not in our heads. We're feeling it in our bellies, in our bodies, in the streets, and on our capital steps. We are closing in on a year of forced immobility, quarantine, and loss that are the reality for over 2 million people living in jails and prisons today and for the millions of family and loved ones who are kept separate from them. As we turn this next chapter of executive leadership, I really want to invite us into a national period of radical contemplation. Radical contemplation on the future of our collective survival, healing, reckoning, and repair. What we need most right now are organized and intentional spaces curated for us to take deep dives into embodied practices that can decarcerate not just our minds, but our bodies, our relationships, and reliance on this punitive pattern of privatized freedom and liberate us into the material truth of our interdependence, interconnection, and love in real time. For those of us who stand, stay, and seek refuge within the borders of the United States. This is an especially challenging meditation since independence is our first precept. It's one that directs, that's directly responsible for generations of frontier forged notions of rugged individualism, personal responsibility, retributive justice, and settler colonial justifications for vigilante violence, mob rule, and let's just call it what it is, it's piracy. We are addicted to these delusions of independence. By any means, violence begets domination, begets control and subjection of others, begets the deterioration of an intimate sense of our own connection to our humanity based in empathy and displaces it for an intimate sense of our own humanity based on domination, on ownership, and on the will to wield life like a weapon. Right. It's kind of like this is this like opposition as opposed to care and as opposed to nutrient nutri uh, uh, care and um uh what is the word <laughs> um nurturing <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to nurturing we're being weaponized and this is one of the kind of core concepts that Reverend Angel brings into the work of Radical Dharma is that we have to disrupt, we have to disarm, and we have to um, deconstruct this incredible matrix of violence that has been naturalized, that's been taken for granted. It's not like the violence that happens, um, that happened to George Floyd just happened this summer. This has been happening for generations, long before I was born. In perpetuity, in with impunity, this is a violence that's been sanctioned, right? In our name. And in order to begin to roll back the kind of consciousness, the common sense 
that makes sense of that kind of violence and conceals it within the home, we have to begin with ourselves. We have to begin with the kind of uh, violence we have swallowed, with the kind of punitive response to our own ignorance that we've inhabited for far too long, for far too many generations. Um, this is why I have to write everything down because otherwise I'll get so far off. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure we got this last part before we go into some centering because I think this is a lot and I just want to make sure we get some space to breathe. Um, so it's displacing, right? This, uh, this, this lack of our humanity is really displacing an intimate sense of our own humanity. Um, we are ignorant to the effects of this addiction to carceral logics on our spirits, on the earth, and on future generations. So let's just take a moment because I know this stuff gets me in my head and I really want to find a solution. Um, I really want to grasp as quickly as possible for a way out. But I know from my own training that this is not the way. This is not the way. The head... The brain can be brilliant, as people have told me in the past. And it's not a way out. It becomes a trap in and of itself. So take a moment to take a comfortable seat. And take a moment to breathe from the belly. This breathing deep into whatever tight spaces you might find as you're sitting or standing or walking wherever you are in your day. Really inviting the breath in, welcoming it in to touch the frozen, numbed out spots and warm the sore spaces. On your next out breath, release fully. Pausing at the bottom of your breath as you release it and contracting the chest just a little more to get that last little stale piece of air out of the lungs. Without effort, allow the in breath and let it swell up through the heart, shoulder to shoulder, broaden into relationship with yourself exposing your heart radiating out through your inherent tenderness and dignity connecting your body to your breath your feet to the earth holding you up Allow that breath to cleanse all the spaces it touches with the ancient heat of love. And I invite you to drop your attention down into your belly. The core of our being just does so much work to keep us alert and strong and steady. Bring some loving attention to this soft belly. I invite you to notice how the breath is moving the belly. The outer flesh, flesh presses out on the in-breath. And then gently draws in towards the back body on the out breath. Moving whatever is uneasy or stuck in the energy that you're holding. 
allow it to ride the river of the breath through the body and out the nose. Live here in this movement of the rise and the fall. No correcting. No judging. Just noticing and feeling, making space for the full body consciousness to bathe here. Inviting your whole heart, mind, body self to become still and bathe in the movement of the breath and the belly. If you begin to sense the familiar pull, the pull of the attention to move away from the seat of stillness, that's okay. Let thoughts run like trains along tracks of the past and anticipations of the future. Watch how they draw your consciousness. Watch their desperation for solutions, for an answer. This is our practice. To simply notice how we slip from our seat of really feeling ourselves to somehow being on a fast train to elsewhere. To save to solve, to resolve, to redirect, distract, dismiss. And sometimes we just discuss, discuss the disgust. We touch on until we bore ourselves to death. We know where those trains go. We've been there. A step next movement in this massive transformation of society is not gonna come. Is not gonna come from our minds. from my gut understanding that something else is necessary. That this isn't working for anyone. Homemaking in this endless sea of inherent life force that floats here, just below the belly, just below the belly button. This is radical homemaking. A Dharma found waiting in the breath that laps like a gentle wave upon the shore of sensation, interconnected spirit, universal consciousness. 
true love and that's true liberation. I invite you to begin to close your practice by sending deep gratitude to this soft belly seat of your breath for being open to the truth of interconnection, the truth, the grief, the pain, the joy. If only for a moment of your own will, celebrating this knowledge of the truth of what time it is. bringing some gentleness and compassion for self, for your own journey to your physical body, I invite you to extend gratitude through your hands to your belly and slowly draw the hands up across the chest, reaching for both shoulders, give yourself a big squeeze. Inhale, exhale. There is great power in our retreat from the everyday theater of power. It's here that we find both strength, a root, and a way. Thank you for practicing with me. These realities can be incredibly overwhelming and leave us feeling, I don't know what I can do. My students often say, well, what are we supposed to do? Um, part of the work that I try to incorporate into my classes is an invitation to really acknowledge in your body that this is a lot, and yet it must be confronted. Focusing on the rise and the fall of the breath and all that it contains is such a great metaphor for understanding how our political body is holding so much and isn't breathing. This cry that I can't breathe isn't just the cry of those in distress. It's the cry of the nation. It's the cry of the nation. And if we listen to the breath, struggling to breathe, we'll know more of what the body needs what care looks like for one body is going to be particular to where that body lives, how it's oriented within what the Kambahi River Collective called the interlocking systems of oppression. Everybody absorbs the impact different. Every transgenerational line holds trauma according to the things it had to hold down to survive. Every breath becomes a new opportunity to build a closer relationship with the patterns of the body that it has habituated, what it holds, what it needs, and what it might need to let go of. So we begin with our breath and the core of our body, heart, mind, because it is the space of dark and quiet from which the greatest leaps of faith grow. This is why contemplative practice begins to the work, but then you must have embodied practices. You must have embodied practices because each of us is born literally from this space of darkness. And though um, many of us learn to fear the unknown. Working with the breath can really help us to be in intimate relationship with the darkest and quietest pieces of ourselves. In a recent piece published in Lion's Roar by uh, Zenju Ertholin Manuel Sensei, one of the first black women to receive transmission in the Zen tradition, um, whom I got to meet uh, in 2019 at a Black Buddhist gathering in California. Absolutely incredible, incredible experience to be there and to meet her finally. But she, in this essay, was speaking about Daikokuten, a deity of great blackness. And she writes, everyone and everything come out of darkness. Therefore, it is everywhere and in everything. Only our limited perception distorts the truth. 
how do we begin to embrace the darkness, the shortness of breath, the discomfort, right? A lot of the tools that we have at our disposal are, are inadequate. Um, guilt, mastery, these are not sufficient. Hardcore alliance, self-sacrifice, these actually aren't sustainable, right? So Zenju is one of many Dharma teachers and lay people of color working to turn the wheel, turning up the work of radical Dharma in ways that take seriously the complete Dharma of darkness, the root truth of stillness. And in this loophole of retreat from the unbearable burden of being a problem, to paraphrase, to paraphrase W.E.B. Du Bois, we build relationship with our whole selves, right? When we no longer see ourselves through that lens, that darkness is a problem, but begin to see uh, what's once been seen as the problem, as the missing link, right? This is why Black Lives Matter is <laughs> because we can't all matter without all of us. We all matter. We have to be here. We all have to be here and part of the project. So over the last 20 years, my dear friends, mentor, teacher, Dharma sibling, co-authors, Reverend Angel William, Kyoto Williams, and Lama Rod Owens have been sowing the seeds of a new Dharma informed by the truth of their embodied experience of intersectionality, awakening, and liberation. As Reverend Angel writes in the introduction of Radical Dharma, there is really only one way to observe the constructs that lead to harm and suffering out in the world. And we must first see and account for those harms and sufferings that are closest to home, those that make us feel most at home, right? Those that we have become familiar with. Sitting is itself a simple practice for bearing witness to that which recedes from notice. And we know this as practitioners, but bringing it into the context of racial justice really brings to relief how much we've been um, receding from. And I say this as a black person, receding from myself, which is why the first chapter uh, that I contributed to Radical Dharma was really about coming to the cushion and realizing that I had left myself behind as a black queer woman a long time ago. And that that recuperation was going to require first grief, first a sense of loss, um, of not being my own best friend. Uh, when, you know, when you can't have your own back, how is anyone supposed to have it, have it with you or for you? Um, seeing and accounting for what is, stepping back from our patterns to observe them more clearly without judgment, we come to see truths hidden right under our nose. In the book and in the spaces the book has seeded, uh, retreats and circles and conversations, online spaces, um, we're just seeing an incredible application of this contemplative approach that is embodied and is necessarily collective. And what I'm starting to lay out for you here are some of the principles that we call them the Radical Dharma Five Framework for Liberation. And they are simple, but in concert, transformative. And I only say that because I've seen it, literally seen people come with the best of intentions, surface what's been, they've been receding from, and then leave so much more connected to their purpose, to each other. Um, the communities that have been forged through these spaces continue to rage through social media. So um, Radical Dharma is really holding dynamic and embodied space for healing the harm of white supremacy, what Reverend Angel calls backwards, by dropping into the belly and noticing what lives there. If you can't see it, you can't change it, she says, right? The Western culture teaches us, especially those of us living in academic spaces, to privilege the freedom of the mind. In this belly breath bath lies the seat of our most vital source of freedom, freedom of the body. This is the kind of freedom that fosters the kinds of knowing that are liberated from the habituated logics of capital, carceral, colonial, space and governance. 
dropping into the kinds of knowing that arise in moments of peaceful retreat from having to know anything at all. <laughs> this is how we come to know what time it is beyond clocks and calendars, beyond deadlines and to-do lists. I am most interested in how we come to know where we are, what matters most right now, and move with that knowledge. Move with it with fearlessness and grace, as Reverend Angel invited us in her first book, Being Black. This is a radical dharma. It arises from the belly, like a deep breath, that from the ruins of modern progress clears space for us to bear witness to the world as it is, so we can see, feel, and take note of the stifled state of the political body. This cleansing breath of a radical dharma oxygenates the parched soil carceral capitalism leaves in its wake, aerating the ashen earth until the ground of loss and disrepair can grow fertile once again. The cleansing breath of radical dharma is centered in a practice of truth-telling, unapologetic commitment to horizontal leadership, fierce love for knowledge of self, sensuous healing magic, and irreverent audacity for collective survival. This is a dharma that can channel the fiery balm of choice into tight, otherwise tight spaces, into the most numbed out and bruised places. From incidents in the life of a slave girl to blues women to Black Lives Matter organizing, abolition is always already present in these liberatory communities of care. The word abolition may sound or feel too extreme, too absurd, too radical to a body contracted by fear, insecurity, or trust of change. Metaphors of deep breath, new life, seeding, fertilizing, and fresh growth resonate here, not accidentally, but precisely because as Joy James writes, the womb of Western progress leveraged the reproductive force of Black women's bodies in service to the birth of its own future. The fact that Generations of Black women, Black family networks, and communities of color are so easily and systematically discarded, dispossessed, and disenfranchised from spaces of freedom in service to the self-reproduction of these carceral logics and colonial traditions of white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy means that abolition is our birthright. Our third answer to the all too limiting binary, revolutionary imperative to live free or die. Our interdependent reiteration on the modern project of the universal liberation. As we are learning from the advent of concentric circles of pandemic, from climate change to poverty, to racial capital, the rise of fascism and coronavirus, we understand that safety from the suffering that comes with these truths is delusion. It is an inescapable kind of suffering, but all too easily disassociated from, intellectualized. We move away from it even as the reality presses, on a, presses down on us from every point. No one escapes the seductions of this imagination of freedom as independence from suffering. Right? This freedom as independence over interdependence, right? That values property over people, contract over custom. The first truth of this enlightenment logic is live free or die, and freedom's only accountability becomes to itself an abstract concept that cannot provide shelter, cannot care, cannot provide love or food. In defense of this imperative, however, we have in defense and service, we serve and protect this principle. It is wild, even in progressive spaces. And I'm saying this clearly because it's important right now to notice the difference between going, going along to get along and transformation. And what we need now is not more people to just follow the rules. The rules are clearly insufficient to get us to the place that we need to be. And so we need rule breakers to get us to new rules. Um, and we need to surface those in conversation, in conflict. It's going to be messy. 
And so the more centered we are in ourselves, the easier it will be to contend with these practices of congregation as we move forward. And this is why the Radical Dharma Five is so important. So the Radical Dharma Five is contemplative approach. It doesn't just have to be meditation. You can incorporate storytelling, journaling, going for walks, right? Um, there's poetry, there's all kinds of ways to engage in contemplative practices. Um, so we don't call it practices, we say contemplative approach because that element of receding is really what's important, right? Embodied practices, oh yes, there's a correlation to the elements too. Oh, the one last thing about contemplative is that it's really about receding from danger, receding from every day in order to actually take inventory. What is in here? What am I holding? Right? What have I been ignoring? What have I been policed into incarcerating in myself, in my relationships, in my expectations of the world around me? Right? Contemplative approach. Number two is embodied practice. Right? Where are you holding that indigestible piece of your reality? A lot of times for me, it's my jaw. Oh goodness, so much tension gets held here. And so I do a lot of embodied practices to open my hips, sitting in a chair that's uh, perched at an angle so that I'm not sitting at a right angle. Those right angles are, cha are very challenging to be creative in, right? So contemplative approach, embodied practice, liberatory path. For me, the liberatory path is all about all of the people who have come before me. How have they brought us to this moment? Is it possible for me to bring them with me everywhere I go? Absolutely, absolutely. We do this with our sacred texts. We do this with our ancestor meditations and totems. We do this through ceremony with community. We do this by reading our history and understanding how people before us got free. Um, part of the work that I do is about studying the anti-slavery movement for clues, for protocols, for instruction manuals on how to stay human under duress and how to make sure my freedom isn't the only thing that matters, but it's my entire community's freedom. How do people work at that level of collaboration? Liberatory Path is the instruction manual that we forget that we have and we instead try to manage it ourselves, solve the problem, be the hero and reinvent the wheel when in fact, everything we need is already here. Number four is prophetic praxis. And when I say this gut, belly, breath, bath is a space of knowing what time it is, I mean it in that sense of prophecy. And prophecy, not in the sense of the future necessarily, but of the present. What are you holding right now? What do you need right now? Sometimes the most prophetic acts that we can exact for ourselves are stopping and doing a redo. <laughs> I mean, like, actually, this is what I need, right? Um, I did this for this talk. <laughs> I just really needed it to be a little less um, staged. So hopefully this, uh, this style is working for folks. And I really look forward to hearing your questions. We're almost at the end here. So contemplative approach, embodied practice, liberatory path, prophetic praxis. And of course, the last is collective process. And I want to say for collective process, we're not all designed to do the same work of liberation at the same time, in the same way. This is not the way we were created. Um, I, one of the things that I take from my Christian upbringing in my father's ministry is that we all have different gifts. And I really, really value that because it means that if you don't know what your gift is, you're likely to try to replicate the way other people are showing up. But the way other people show up probably isn't highlighting the best way that you could, right? So for me, collective process is really about knowing yourself knowing what you have to offer and knowing what's valuable about that, what's critical about that, and being unafraid to bring it to the table. I was talking to a good friend, a Zen monk recently, Seho, whom I also met at the Black Buddhist Gathering. 
And he shared with me the example of the sun, that the sun shines equally on everything. It doesn't hold back. And this is the practice of collective process, right? We all have to shine in order for this to change. So in order for us to see what has to be changed. So who are your people? How are you getting ready? What's the collective practicing edge of your work in these times? These are the five and through the work of Radical Dharma, we are slowly but surely changing the way that I think about change. Um, you know, the, the work of Radical Dharma is really working me to not separate out what it means to be a professor from what it means to be a practitioner, from what it means to be an activist. These kind of separations of self, again, are carceral logics, navigating and like partitioning our human experience in ways that have no integrity with our everyday. I am the same person on the cushion that I am in the classroom, that I am um, in the streets. If I don't understand that, then certainly no one else will. And so this process of integration is actually a process of healing. And it's wild to me that the efforts that we need to take to defund the police really begin with our own self-healing um, in addition to writing our politicians and being in the streets. I'm not saying that this is an either or, but if we only show up in the streets, if we only write our politicians, if we only fight for policy change and reform, we're missing the forest for the trees because what we really want is transformation. And we know that in our gut, but in our heads, it gets translated into something concrete, something winnable, something material. When really, really what we want is connection. We want people to not be separated from their loved ones. We want people to be able to defend themselves in their, um, in their integrity and for people to be held accountable for the harm that they're perpetuating. And so moving towards spaces of transformative justice and community accountability are really pushing the imagination of what justice can look like. And um, I just am so excited to do this work with you all um, in this time that I have with you and look forward to hearing your questions and conversations about this, this topic. Um, it is my honor to be with you all. I just want to close with um, a few words from the last part of um, the last essay that uh, I submitted for, for the Radical Dharma collaboration. What I would like to propose in these closing words is that what we need now is not more freedoms, but more fugitives from the kind of freedom that we have right now. This is not sufficient. We need fugitives to find the loopholes in our language of liberation we need fugitives now to keep abolishing the legacies of slavery, colonialism, and genocide that persist in the present day. What the world needs now is a pursuit of freedom rooted not in fear of someone taking what's ours, but in a radical kind of love that refuses to settle for meanings of justice, safety, and independence that recreate the shackles, borders, color lines, and other punitive forms of policing and surveillance we just escaped to get our freedom. Our imaginations of freedom have to be born out of a practice of embodying, inhabiting, making home in places of containment with an impossible, improbable sense of unity, compassion, conviction, and possibility. Rather than envision freedom as our inoculation from difference, as freedom from a collective commitment to those still in bondage, I'm interested in how we can make possible a new politics of friendship, a new practice of, I'm gonna say homemaking, I said the political, but that's because I was still a grad student. A new way of being together in which we can imagine the value of freedom anew, not as an abstract set of ideals that conceal the consequence and violence, let's just say it, violence of our freedoms, but as a practice of mutual respect, reconciliation and repair, through which our communities might heal from the injury American freedoms have exacted on us all. 
not just for one. What we need now are sweet ways for everyone to remain fugitive within the domain of state-sanctioned violence and neglect that would otherwise render all our lives immaterial. Thank you all so much. Ashe, and go well.